great reminder to us today and a big part of the, the message that we're about to hear. It's been a great day so far. Thank you for all of our leaders who came up today and gave us a little snippet about what's going on here at St. Timothy, all the things that will be coming up in this fall. And I, I got to be honest, I'm really excited about some of the things that are happening, some of the things that are going to be occurring this fall. What are going to be happening today after worship? There's a lot of really neat things, a lot of great leaders here, a lot of wonderful things are happening here, many people that we're going to be serving and it reminds me that we are becoming a mission-oriented church, which means that at the heart of our identity and calling is to serve others as Christ has served us. And for me, that is an exciting thing. And it really filters through every other committee in that way. Well, today, we're going to be beginning a new series on Paul's letter to the Philippians or to the Philippian church. This church that Paul is writing to is, of course, located in the city of Philippi, which was an ancient Macedonia, and if you don't know where that is, that's now a part of modern-day Greece. And in the time of Paul, for many hundreds of years, it was a critically important city because of so many different things. It's located close to the Aegean Sea, and it was on the royal trade route that ran from east to west along the entire length of Macedonia, which means that for the trades, for people coming through, it was a really important place. Think about like the old Route 66, how the only reason cities existed were because of that route that people would drive along um, and it was a, I've heard so many wonderful stories and seen so many wonderful places along that route. I've driven part of it myself. Or think about why certain cities exist, and it's because of trade. And that is why Paul chose this particular city to plant a church in. Now, the city itself was named after Philip II, the father of Alexander the Great, in the year 356 BC. And so, this city of Philippi goes way back into history. Back when it was first, uh, when it first became a city around the time of Philip, it was located close to gold and silver mines. And so that was one of the reasons why it had become a trade city. People would come and mine the gold, and then they would get it, and they would ship it down into the ports, and it would go around the world. Well, 400 years later, after Paul has come by, the mines, they've dried up a little bit, so they're not mining for gold anymore 400 years later, but it is still a massive trade route. And so people are coming in and out of Philippi. And that's something that we need to know, that when Paul is planting churches, whether it's here at Philippi or Thessalonica or, or Corinth or any of those cities that we have these letters for, is because they were really important cities. It makes a lot of sense that Paul would plant churches in cities where there was a lot of people. If we want to know a little bit more, we can read in the book of Acts exactly what Paul is up to. And the stories that we read about Paul and his missionary journeys, they are amazing. The things that he went through to plant churches, the trips that he went on, the things that he encountered are amazing. We do read in Acts chapter 16 that Paul had received a vision from a man in Macedonia who begged them to come and visit. And so they did. Paul, who did not travel alone, but Paul, along with Timothy, Luke, and many others, traveled to the region of Macedonia. They stopped in several different cities, finally stopping in Philippi, that was this leading city. It was there that they met Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth, who was baptized along with her whole family into faith. It was in Philippi that Paul threw a demon out of a little slave girl. And it's one of the funniest stories in all of Acts because the reason why Paul threw this demon out is because they were annoyed. And it's, it's a very silly story if you read about that. But this girl is set free and everyone is very upset about that. And so Paul and his traveling companions are thrown into jail because of that. Well, we read that that night an earthquake opened up the prison doors and the jailer was going to kill himself because he thought all his prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, no, we're all still here. And that night the jailer took Paul and his companions into his house and they too became believers. They too were baptized. There are amazing stories about Paul in Philippi. 
Later in Acts 20, we read that Paul, again with more traveling companions, including Timothy and Luke, they visited Philippi again. The second visit occurred right after a riot in Ephesus. And so Philippi had become a place of refuge for him. And so we're meant to imagine that these are whom to who Paul is writing at this church. It is why that this particular letter is so full of love and grace and kindness. We're meant to imagine that Paul is writing to Lydia and her family, that Paul is writing to this jailer and his family, members of this new church that had been planted with so much love. We can tell that Paul knows these people, that Paul cares for them deeply, and his love comes through throughout this entire letter. And I'm really excited to be preaching on it as we go through it this whole fall. Now we have an opportunity to encounter this word together. And so I invite you, if you are able and willing, to stand with me, either in body or in spirit, so that together we may stand and read aloud this passage So let us now read it aloud together. This is from Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Let us now read it aloud together. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from this first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. For whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this letter that we have been given, this letter that has existed for 2,000 years that we might encounter it today. I pray, Lord, that you will help us, that as we journey through this passage together, that you may give us your spirit of wisdom and understanding, that you may help me today to speak your words of truth, and that together we may journey in partnership as your disciples. We pray this in your great and glorious name. Amen. You may be seated, friends. There's an interesting note that we need to get to right at the beginning, the structure that Paul refers to in this early church, in which from the very beginning of this letter, he says that this letter is to all the saints, together with the overseers and the deacons. And I love that. To all the saints, it's a reference to the whole church. That all the believers who would gather, they are referenced as the saints. And that is to everyone. Paul is writing to the whole church, but then he makes a reference to the overseers and the deacons. And another word for overseer is elder. So he is writing to those who are also in leadership. And this structure of the early church, it already shows us what the church is going to be like. These new believers had to understand something. That... Being a saint set them apart from everyone else. It gave them a special relationship with Christ. It is a reminder to all of us that we too are considered to be saints. That not because we've done a miracle, because we're not Catholics, and not because we have our whole lives together. That's not what being a saint is. It it is this uniqueness that we have because of Jesus, this set apart. 
And then that leadership structure of elders and deacons, of overseers, the way that the church was set up, a group of leaders entrusted with overseeing the church. I could see Lydia being a part of that. I could see this jailer being a part of that. Other people that we read about in the book of Acts being a part of this early, early leadership. The structure came to Paul from the apostles as they began to think of what it meant to follow Jesus to understand that those of us who gather, well, we need some instruction, don't we? If we're going to become faithful, we need to learn more about why we're gathering, as well as recognizing that when there are people who need help, we need to be able to give that help, hence the elders and the deacons. What a, what a wonderful thing to consider, isn't it? To know that the structure that we have as Presbyterians, it goes back that far. Our structure of elders and deacons is birthed from the early church in the sharing of the work in which the authority lies within the group, and I love that. I also find it so profound that Paul is telling the church that he is praying for them, and in fact, he finds it joyful to pray for every single one of them. Praying for the church we are meant to see and for the people of it is one of the best possible things that we can do, regardless of what's happening, good times or bad. We can see here that Paul is praying with joy because with them, he is having a partnership in the gospel, something that they have together. And I love that word, partnership. Paul, he's the one who has planted the church, but even he understands the concept of partnering with one another because truly, as followers of Jesus, only Jesus can be really our head. Only he's the boss. There can only be number one, and it's not any of us, it's Christ, which means that the rest of us, all of us together as we are gathered, we are gathered in partnership together to serve him. This word uh, for partnership in Greek is this word koinonia, which is sometimes translated as fellowship. But partnership is likely a better translation here because of what Paul is saying. First, later in the letter, he says that we are partners together in grace. Now think about that for a second. What Paul is communicating is this. That as partners in grace, it means that all of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. That means that all of us share in the partnership of grace because all of us need grace. If there were one among us who did not need grace, well, then they could rise to the, the, above the rest. But can any one of us make that claim? Can any one of us say that we have not sinned, that we have not fallen? Can any one of us say that we're not in need of grace? No. We have all fallen. And so that means that together, as we receive grace, we're partners in grace, which keeps us humble. It reminds us that it is by grace that we are saved, not through our own actions. So that keeps us down. It keeps us lowly. It keeps us from wanting to rise above others. This is what brings us together, our mutual need for grace, our mutual understanding that it is grace that propels us forward. Paul also says that we are partners in the work of the gospel, that together, because we have all received grace, we are all to work for God's kingdom together. We are all to partner with one another in sharing what we know and helping out with others to help others who don't believe to come together that they too might be able to receive grace. Third, we are partners with Christ. That means that his love becomes our love. His joy becomes our joy. His heart beats and our hearts beat with him. He is the head of us. All in all, partnership is a sign of a healthy, mature, and loving church. A church that understands that it is partners with Christ, above all, strives to serve together as one. On the other hand, Disaster happens when we forget this. When we forget to, to partner with one another, when we forget to partner with Christ, when we forget to partner in grace, doesn't it go sideways? Isn't that when we start to get in trouble? Isn't that when we start to die a little bit? Isn't that when we begin to serve ourselves instead of serving Christ? 
And maybe you've been in a church like that before. I know I have. When elders begin to serve themselves or when deacons stop helping, when pastors try to gather power, when the saints live like everyone else, when the church is no longer really partnering with Christ, it's just more of a country club. We've got to ask ourselves, when that begins to happen, are you really the church anymore? I would say no. It's just a reminder to us that we need to come coming back to this idea of being partners together, partners with Christ, partners in grace, partners together. And because we are partners, whether pastor, elder, deacon, saints together, what Paul says next, I love. It's one of those great lines, this line that you probably have heard before. But he says that because of this, he is convinced that the work that has begun in us will be carried on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. This word completion means to bring about a full accomplishment with nothing left undone. In other words, Paul's telling us a couple things. One, God is not done with us yet. He has begun his work in us, but he's not done with us yet. And he will not leave us alone. He will not abandon us. He will not turn away from us. He will not lead us astray until his work in us becomes perfected. This is a similar promise to the one that Jesus gives to Peter, that Jesus will work in Peter when he builds his church upon him. And Paul is echoing that promise here that the work that God does in us will continue on. And I love that. And this promise is the opposite of what sometimes happens here on earth. We heard Kathy talk about something about the own projects that we have. How many times have we had a project only to abandon it halfway through because we either ran out of money or we got bored or we got busy? It reminds me of the city jail that Detroit started many years ago. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ooh. That project started in 2011. I was amazed by that. I'm like, 2011? Wow. It was halted just two years later after massive cost overruns. Then Dan Gilbert offered to buy the site multiple times along with developer Steve Ross. And at first they were rebuffed and then they were able to buy it. And though the half-built jail started to get demolished in 2018 and a development plan was submitted, what is of that site? I can still see pictures in my mind of that half-built jail as a sign of something that has begun but not has been completed. There's so much time and money that have been spent, but really nothing to be shown of it. It also reminds me of this television program that Tina and I love watching called Grand Designs. It's a show out of Britain, and it's a show where they take these audacious designs that people have and try to build these houses. And the thing that is really frustrating is when the people don't finish the house. And it's a kind of show that if they don't complete the house, they get to the end of the program and the house isn't done. And it's like, really? Seriously? Uh, there's been a couple times where people ran out of money or time. One of the ones that really sticks in my mind was this guy was trying to make a cob house, which is a combination of straw and mud, and the straw and the mud is packed together. It's kind of like adobe houses here in the U.S. And he was building this immensely large cob house, and it just kept going on. And they actually came back as a program, and he was still building the house, and it was not done. And it was so frustrating. And I think we understand that frustration. Perhaps the only thing worse than not starting a project is leaving it half done. And thankfully, that's not the way that God works in us. The work that God has begun in us, the work of becoming more graceful and more loving and serving with whole hearts and becoming transformed and becoming more like Christ, that God will not leave his work in us halfway done. God is taking our lives and will continue to transform us into his image until we have been completely transformed. Do we even understand the implications of this? It means that we can always be confident of God's grace. It means that we never have to worry if God has stepped away or if God is near. The promise is that God will carry out his work to completion in us. 
That's a powerful thing for us to know and to believe and to consider. One thing that this letter also is set apart from so many others that Paul writes to the churches that he plants is that this particular church has such a special place in his heart. We read in this beginning of how thankful he is for them, that he has a joy and an affection, and that he just desires for them to abound in love, to discern what's best, and to be filled with fruits of righteousness. And that's what we're going to see throughout this whole series, of how thankful Paul is for the people of this church, and that he just intends to encourage them. And I love here that he says that he loves praying for this church. All that Paul wants is for this gathering, the gathering in his church in Philippi, to just grow in faith. He is focused on the right things, the things that matter. And sometimes in ministry, we're not always focused on those things. The other day I was on a Zoom call with several other pastors. We meet once a month on a Zoom to just talk about what's going on in our lives, to pray for each other. And it's a really good time. And we were talking about how tempting it is, as pastors especially, but also within leaders, to focus on the numbers, to focus on our budgets, or to focus on how many people we get in and out of the church on a regular basis. And we talked about how tempting it is to believe that if we just had more people, that our problems would be solved. But the one pastor spoke up, and this pastor said that that belief is a fallacy, because If that's your goal, to just get bigger, then that becomes your only goal, and you're forgetting everything else. And as we talked about that, there was a sense of agreement that if while we're focusing it is on that, then we forget to grow in our faith. We forget to grow by grace. We forget about the work that God is doing in us. Instead, we are to be more like Paul, thankful for what we do have, loving those who we are called to love, partnering with one another in the sharing of the gospel, filling ourselves with joy and affection for one another, and for the opportunities that God gives us, understanding that God is always with us. That trap of playing the numbers game, it steals it all away. But the power of being thankful for what we do have, that is what helps us to be faithful. During my sabbatical, one thing that I kept coming back to was how thankful I was for all of you, for this church, for this body. I had this great recognition, this deep appreciation of the affection that I have for you and how blessed I felt and continue to feel to be able to partner with all of you to spread the good news. I, like Paul, have a joy to serve with you, to partner with you as we serve Christ together, that together we discern what's important, that together we partner in doing the good work, together we are filled with the fruits of righteousness because Christ is in our midst. And I love that. It's at the heart of who we are called to be. And I too feel what Paul is feeling for the church here. Coming back, I feel so energized and passionate. I feel the joy and the warmth of this church and the people of it, all of you. And I can't wait to see what God's going to do next because of this great promise that God will carry on what he has begun to completion. So friends, let's continue to partner together. Let's continue to see what God is going to do in us. Let's continue to serve together. And we'll see what God has. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather and to be in worship today for your love and the joy that you give us, the way that you work within us and don't abandon us. We thank you, God, for all that you have done, for the way that you give us joy and for your grace. Help us to continue to partner together with you to do your calling, to fulfill those moments that you give us so that we might be faithful. God, we thank you for your goodness. And we pray this in your name. Amen.